What is the eschatological position that Luther and the first Lutherans held? Okay, so what's what's the view of the end times that, that Lutherans, the early Lutherans take? And there really is, there is actually a unified position because in a lot of other traditions, there's, um, you know, like in the reform tradition, it's kind of open. So you can talk to a reform person who says, well, I'm, I'm premillennial, I'm historic premillennial, or I'm postmillennial or amillennial. Um, the Lutheran tradition is historically amillennial. Okay. And, and that really was the, the primary view in the church uh, since at least the time of Augustine. Um, Origen was a big proponent of amillennialism. Uh, St. Augustine kind of solidified amillennialism, at least for the Western church, um, with, with his approach to Revelation chapter 20. And there were premillennialists in the early church. There were actually a lot of them. So if you look at Justin Martyr, it's pretty clearly premillennial. Hippolytus is pretty clearly premillennial. Um, but they also write that there are different views. So even in the early church, there were different views. There was basically a premillennial understanding and an amillennial understanding. Um, I have a hard time finding a postmillennial view, at least in the earliest church. And part of that's probably because their situation. I mean, it was pretty like negative. I mean, in, in terms of their relation to the government. So they're not thinking about victory in, in terms of political influence and things like that that you find in postmillennialism. Um, so so I don't think those ideas really come to the Christianization of the Roman Empire. But for the most part, the church historically, just in following Augustine, has just been amillennial. Um, now you have some differences. Um, there, there are, especially in the, among the radical Franciscans, you have a, a rebirth of uh, Kiliasm or premillennialism, and there's even some really radical forms of, of Kiliasm that show up. Uh, in in some ways, Frank uh, Gumerlach is a patristic scholar who who has um, found a couple radical Franciscans that actually teach dispensational ideas even before dispensationalism. So, yeah, you'll find occasional views like that in the church, but for the most part, amillennialism is just the default view. And so. During the Reformation, you know, Luther takes on the, the amillennial view. He just takes on the default view, what he sees as the historic view, and this is solidified in, in the Augsburg Confession itself. So, so the Augsburg Confession um, does address millennial views. Unlike the Westminster Confession, it actually has a very specific approach, and that is the amillennial one. Now, what it condemns is what is called certain Jewish opinions that are now <laughs> around, which are um, essentially that a, a post-millennial view. Um, what is condemned is very close to a postmillennialism that, that there is the whole world will be Christianized uh, prior to to the coming of Christ. Now that doesn't mean there won't be Christian cultures. See, sometimes people read on millennialism wrongly. Um, that doesn't mean that there won't be Christian cultures in the future, or that Christians shouldn't be interacting with culture, or shouldn't be striving for the betterment of the world. Um, I, I think there's a misunderstanding among uh, postmillennialists of other millennial views that we're all just a bunch of negative. Nancy's, you know, negative Nancy, what a weird phrase, but uh, you know, we're all just very negative about these things uh, and just say, ah, you know, with everything's going to hell in a handbasket, so ah, why polish a sickened ship in the first place? You know, that's not where the early Lutherans are coming from. So they're very much concerned with, you know, Luther writes to the state and, and he's very concerned with the Christian state. He talks about establishing Christian schools and, and they're very much concerned with culture, uh, but but also being being realistic and, and recognizing that, that there's no promise that the culture will be Christianized before Jesus is coming in some grand way. Yes, there will be Christians. Yes, there will be Christian influence in culture. Yes, we should fight for positive good in culture. But but that doesn't lead to some, some eschatological hope that there are mass conversions at the end, that everyone's a Christian by the time Jesus returns. Um, so that's rejected. So that's usually historically been understood among Lutherans as a rejection of both, po both post and pre-millennialism. Um, now, that's not to say that there was never divergence from that, because you do find that in pietism. So the, the early pietists tend to be post-millennial. Now, you also have to realize these categories pre, post, millennial weren't categories they were working with. Um, those are 20th century terms. There's basically kiliasm, which is a millennialism, uh, which would, for a lot of people, actually frame both what we now know as post and pre-millennialism. And then there's just the view that's not Kiliast, which is what we now call amillennialism. But they weren't using those those even the same categories, so it's hard to even read some of those categories into what the discussions were, because they were talking very differently than than we're talking today. So, so we've got um, uh, Philip Jacob Spener, who's the founder of Pietism. He believes that there are some promises in the Bible that the world will be kind of Christianized. So he hopes for these better times that are coming. And and, and so Spener really differentiates himself from the Augsburg Confession on that point, where in every other point, he's pretty much just 
you know, on board with the Lutheran confessions. Um, but that does begin a shift then from Spener into Franca into the rest of pietism, where there is this this emphasis on social change, some of it being very positive. You know, Franca sets up uh, a bunch of orphanages where he emphasizes prayer and, and, and corporate scripture reading uh, and, and things like that within these orphanages. And they're doing some really positive things for, for society. There's some weird things in the Franca too, but, um, but there are some positive goods there. But they're doing them with the goal that the world is one day going to be Christianized in this post-millennial sense. And so you do have a kind of history of post-millennialism within Lutheran pietism, but that's not in our confessions. And that's one of the points that the Orthodox Lutherans who were concerned about some of the things going on in pietism that they, that they raised was that they were buying into Kaleasm, which is condemned in the Augsburg Confession. The Augsburg Confession being like the foundational Lutheran confession. Right. In other words, it's been understood generally that if you're a Lutheran, you got to confess the small catechism and the Augsburg Confession, at least those two. Right. That's kind of the, the minimum. Now, we have the whole Book of Concord, um, but there are some Lutheran traditions that don't actually hold to the whole Book of Concord, but everybody's got to hold to those. Right. Those are the foundational two documents, and they're not very long. And, and but, but the one aspect of those documents that began to be challenged a lot from pietists was that, was the article on the millennium. So... Um, and it's not, you know, the most important thing in our in the Augsburg Confession. It's not like it's a central point. It's it's mentioned once, but it is still mentioned, so it's still part of our confessional tradition. Um, so then, after Pietism, you do have a rise of premillennialism in American Lutheranism, and what's argued, and this is even from some really great theologians. You know, Revere Franklin Widener is. You know, I'm publishing his works with my publishing house. I love Widener's works. He's one of my favorite, uh, you know, Lutheran theologians of all time. I think he's fantastic. And, and he pretty strictly just follows the Lutheran scholastics in, in many regards, um, not just recapitulating them, but even adding to their arguments and bringing them into the, the modern context. Well, his modern context 100 years ago now, uh, but still even answering questions that we're still wrestling with today uh, as after the Enlightenment that maybe the Lutheran scholastics weren't. So I, I love Widener. I think he's fantastic. I think there's so much good to be found in him. Um, but in his Revelation commentary, he defends premillennialism. And, you know, I don't know, something in the water in the 19th century. Everybody was premillennial back then, even the Lutherans, and I don't get it. <laughs> it was just the thing to believe in America. It's like the uniquely American belief. And, and even if they rejected, obviously, you know, Darby's dispensationalism, there are these parts of, of Lutheranism that otherwise are solidly confessional that believe in premillennialism. And, um, you know, the Missouri Synod and the Synodical Conference always rejected Kiliasm. Um, and this was a point of debate. Um, they said, we can't fellowship with those who hold to a premillennialist view. Um, and what, but what they argued was what the Augsburg Confession rejects is not premillennialism, but postmillennialism. That's the argument anyway. And they called it a hard millennialism, which they considered postmillennialism, which is what, you know, a lot of the Puritans held to. They're saying that's the kind of stuff that we reject. Specifically, uh, the, those who are writing the Augsburg Confession are tying this to a lot of the Anabaptist approaches to Christianization of the world, um, that everyone's going to be converted. Um, and they said, well, the soft millennialism or premillennialism really isn't what's even being addressed in that article at all. So we're justified in believing it. So there are Lutherans who consider themselves confessional Lutherans who hold a full subscription to the Lutheran confessions in early American Lutheranism who say that they're premillennialists. And they're, they're trying to argue that the, the confessions themselves allow for that. I don't buy it. Um, and I think most Lutherans today don't buy it. So you're not going to find a lot of confessional Lutherans today who are, are premillennial, but you will find some groups. So um, the groups that nowadays are Lutheran and premillennial or not even so much postmillennial, even in the, those who are heirs of pietism, I don't really find a kind of postmillennial view. It's really more of a premillennial one than I find. Um, but you will find in some of the churches influenced by pietism. So in America, that would basically be two, the Association of Free Lutheran Congregations, um, sometimes called the Free Lutheran Church or the AFLC, um, and the other is the Church of the Lutheran Brethren, the CLB. Both of the uh, Church of the Lutheran Brethren is officially premillennial, whereas the the Free Lutheran Church has some premillennialism in it. It's not like everyone's premillennial, but it's considered an allow allowable view. They do subscribe to the Augs both of those church bodies do subscribe to the Augsburg Confession and the Small Catechism. They interpret it in the way that those early American Lutherans interpreted it, that it's not actually condemning premillennialism. I disagree. 
but that's where they're coming from. So there is an approach to Lutheranism, which actually does hold to a form of premillennialism. Again, I disagree with it, but it's there. Um, but in terms of the confessional tradition, the early Lutherans, Luther, the writers of the, the Book of Concord, they all would have been amillennial. 